Great. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the last lecture today. Uh, I will continue our discussion of uh, BSM uh, physics at colliders. Okay. So yesterday we end up with this uh, very nice picture. Okay. I uh, um, that uh, describe seems to describe when I pr collide two protons. Let's call proton A. We're typically in the central mass frame uh, of the two protons, okay, with energy E, zero, zero, E, and proton B with energy E, zero, zero, minus E. Obviously, I'm in the central mass frame of these two protons, uh, along the, moving along the Z direction, and I ignore the proton mass, okay? Uh, what I actually is uh, colliding because proton is not a fundamental particle, I'm colliding two components of them called the parton A and parton B. And the cross section, what I'm supposed to observe the events of interest of A, B going to a particular final state plus X, where X is all those stuff, okay? Can be written as, can be written as an integral between zero and one of dx1 and zero and one dx2 times so-called parton distribution function of particle A giving me a parton A that takes the momentum fraction x1 defined at the particular real, uh, uh, the scale uh, mu f, I will explain a bit further, and the parton distribution of particle B gave me a parton B, small b, that carries x2 fraction, defined at a particular scale, mu of f, times the Patani cross-section that every one of us know how to, know how to calculate, okay? But of the process of parton a, b going to the final state, okay? And uh, uh, that is a function of the Mandelstam variable s of the uh, 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 proton system times x1 and x2, which are the daughter particle fractional energy, secretly have additional scale dependence that are here, which I'll explain their meaning, okay? So I did a small survey after the class, uh, asked how many of you have seen this equation and, uh, and like this equation. Uh, the answer was uh, uh, Splitting, okay? Half of you haven't uh, really looked at this equation, and uh, um, many of you don't like it, okay? <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> but uh, I want to ask the question in a different way, okay? Uh, who likes this equation? And uh, t can you, and want to say something about it, why you like it? <laughs> <laughs> say something, say something, okay? There's a good physics picture behind, and, uh, but there's also ongoing research topics around that. So anyone raise the hand? There were so many of you raised the hand. It it works. Very good. Uh, it works. It's a, uh, it's a, to a certain level, right? We, we, have, we are physicists. Uh, there's an there's a effective definition. Any other reasons you like it? Ah, so what's the physics intuition on this? It separates different parts. Okay. It, it is clear which, which one Okay, so uh, let me repeat what you said. It's, uh, you said it's clear, it separates each part. You, you, you see which one is colliding with which and uh, uh, what's going on inside, right? So now, uh, oh, anyone else want to say something more about this? Okay, it's, it's, a, it's a battle about your physics picture, okay? So uh, chat with your friends if you don't, don't want to say no, okay? Uh, I, I wouldn't say my picture is the best, but uh, let's think, okay? Proton is not a fundamental particle, right? So let's view them as a bag of particles, <laughs> components. But the, there's a key thing. This bag of particles is not free particle. They are bonded together by interactions, so it's a bag of particles glued together. So in some sense, it's like rigid body in some sense, right? So I'm smashing two bags of particles together. Why? Why I can pick the components of the two bags of particles and let them, saying they are describing, describing the major collision, okay? 
the particles are, are glued together, okay? There's a, there's a, there's the, this particle sees the others while it was in this mother particle, parent particle, proton A, okay? How come when I went to see another uh, particle, uh, a proton B, I suddenly decide to forget all my friends who are glued with, who glued with me together and decide just to meet the proton B and uh, do our hard interaction? Asymptotic freedom, very good. Say a bit more. Okay, uh, this is a, a very nice picture. Uh, 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 so asymptotic freedom is a, is a great way to understand uh, stuff, uh, saying uh, when they are interacting with others, okay, the scale is high, maybe the, my strong interaction is no longer strong. So maybe uh, I don't talk to others. Uh, um, but that doesn't imply my connection with others are at a high scale, right? So this one sees the other one with the high scale, but I may see them at low scale as well. So low scale is bounded together with strong interactions. So my glue doesn't decay, right? So when I smash two bags of, of glue together particle, okay? So uh, I think the physics picture I like, I, uh, when, when, I, when I see this, I'm trying to make sense of it, of it beyond it works, <laughs> was uh, there's a time scale associated with interactions, okay? There's a physics is actually about separation between scales. So the scale of the glue, the, the binding or the talking, the, the glue I put between particles is a strong interaction, lambda QCD. Okay, okay? So the, the but when I interact with the other particle, our, our momentum exchange is so high, it happens at a much higher scale, which is S hat, okay? So this scale is a much short time, okay? Basically it means when this particle sees the other particle, they see the other in the, in the instantaneous moment, the other, my glue, on, had, the, my glue hadn't got time to respond to my, to my interaction yet. Only afterwards, only after we interact, they realize I lost important component in my bag and the other, uh, the other part and decide to panic and uh, form X, okay? So <laughs> it makes sense, okay? But you already see, you already see, this is a very strong assumption that I assume things factorize, okay? With the argument of the time, typical time scale, and also that's a matter of the error I'm going to make, okay? I'm actually not going to be able to say anything around this scale because I assume there's a big scale separation. So factorization, first of all, clearly only works when there's a big scale separation, okay? Question. Yeah. Uh, wh what is the lowest energy uh, scale of PP collider I have you ever built? I would trust. Uh, 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 I, I I trust my experimental colleagues. Uh, <laughs> when they smash protons together, they make a measurement. But as I will show you later, and I hope you understand later, that they can measure a bunch of stuff. The question for us is how to expect, extract from what's in matter to the fundamental physics, the Lagrangian or the BSM, right? So uh, there's a huge step between measurement to theory, okay? Uh, so, so the general, the, the, the only hint I have is I, I want the collision, when, when I can use this factorization formalism, I need a separation of scales. Uh, if, I, you, 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 if you ask me, what's the, in all my papers, what is the lowest S hat you've chosen? Uh, I have to admit, the lowest one I chose was 1 GeV <laughs> squared. That is very extreme. One shouldn't trust. <laughs> uh, Tommy, you want to say something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. So, so GeV realm is okay, right? So I use the lowest one I used was one, but uh, uh, later on we'll see the definition of those particles. Okay. So uh, this is called a factorization. 
and uh, I'm uh, I'm making scale separations. In fact, there's a important quantity here called the mu f. It's called the factorization scale. Okay, so uh, uh, let me just say say the words. Okay, uh, the uh, there's uh, um, infrared divergences. Okay, I tr what I choose the factorization scale means I uh, I decided I decide to uh, uh, to partite in a particular way the amount of uh, IR divergences uh, uh, into a definition of this part on distribution functions. Okay, and uh, one have to keep close track of that. In fact, this uh, 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 it's uh, this uh, factorization scale is uh, infrared scale choice that I make to enable, to, to separate the physics uh, in particular regarding the IR divergence, okay? And that is very kind of complex already. Uh, and uh, uh, later on, you may see some examples related to that. But uh, of course, in my heart scattering, okay? Let's just work out the math. Uh, I think uh, it's very easy to convince yourself the actual Central mass energy, the Mandel stand variable, which is PA plus PB squared, okay, which is S hat, defined as this, equals X1 times PA plus X2 times PB squared. And that equals X1, X2, S. Okay. So this is the Lorentz invariant quantity. And that's what the scale where my collision actually takes place is a characteristic scale of my hard collision, okay? So the actual collision scale is S hat, partonic central mass energy squared. The hard cross section, of course, is sensitive to my choice of factorization scale, which is about uh, the, 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 when I try to regulate the infrared divergence, the, the certain real emission part, I decide to put them into this uh, partonic cross section part. And also, there's a renormalization scale. Let me finish this scale. Renormalization scale in my calculation. Uh, uh, in some sense, renormalization scale is, is trying to, uh, uh, in, in QFT, trying to uh, uh, define or regulate the UV divergences. So they are trying to calculate different part of the divergences in my QFT. And I have to make consistent choice between them, and when I try to define the cross section and make a measurement. So, question: uh, Is there a consistent choice for the factorization scale across the field, or does it depend on the paper you're looking at? Uh, very good question, because I'm going to mention <laughs> a, 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 a common choice of a BSM physicists who are not precision uh, calculation people like myself. Uh, what I <laughs> commonly do is I said. Typically, that's not the best solution. There is a QSD expert that you should consult about the for process by process was the choice. I will just said mu f equals mu r equals s hat. Okay, uh, but that's that's a, a very crude choice. Okay, and uh, one thing I need to mention, and uh, uh, although I argue this picture should work, it doesn't necessarily work. In fact, it has not been proven to work uh, uh, generally for QFT or for, for our standard model. What has been proven is for uh, uh, QED on weak interaction, uh, factorization works. Okay? For Q, uh, QCD, it's only proven process by process. Some of you are working on this. So for a given process of interest, I show that our divergent part in the consistent treatment of my definition of the PDFs and uh, the cross-section calculation cancels each other. Hence, the, the, I can factorize the process, okay? So not fully proven, just uh, uh, did process by process, and often we just uh, assume it works and just keep on doing our calculation. And uh, uh, there's, most of the time, it, uh, it agrees. Whenever it doesn't, uh, there's other layer of physics people can try, okay? So, in some sense, I, the reason I want to emphasize this is not only because it's complex, <laughs> but also it shows in, in some sense the, how physicists think about uh, uh, 
uh, uh, um, microscopic uh, collisions when we involve very complex system, in particular a standard model that involves a strong interaction. Okay, question. Uh, kind of a follow-up question. What is the yeah. physical implication of choosing mu f equals mu r? Uh, um, uh, uh, I mean, so, so I don't have a good answer. Uh, so I hope someone can help me on that. Uh, so when you have multiple scales in your, in your calculation, you also have to take care of the, the additional dependence on the scale separation between those quantities. By basically choosing mu f equals mu r, at least there's a one log I don't need to worry about. <laughs> uh, that's a very lazy answer, not, uh, not uh, entirely correct. So I even hope YouTube would uh, delete my answer on this part. But, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I talk, talk to experts, OK? <laughs> so uh, so that's, that's uh, separation of scales and how we think about uh, 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 collisions. Okay? So now, uh, and it, 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 there's a next layer of uh, uh, the physics, that is, what is this function? What is this uh, part on distribution function? Let me first draw one and then tell you uh, uh, how we interpret them. Okay. So just as Tom said, uh, uh, actually, this is a question for you guys. Uh, uh, PDF in, is trying to describe the uh, the probability for me to find a given parton in uh, in the proton, which is a strongly interacting quantity. Okay, so the proton itself is a is a uh, uh, is a is the confined system of partons. Okay, so uh, how do we determine these parton distribution functions? Where does the PDF come from? Uh, Some of you must know the answer. Where does it come from? Uh, which kind of experiment? DIS, deep in inelastic scattering. Okay, initially, is through the deep in elastic scattering. But, but the first answer is more correct. It means it's coming from experiments in the sense that not only we do that from deep in elastic scattering, uh, which is defined as shining uh, you know, electrons at uh, uh, protons or nucleus at high energy, but also we can extract that from collider collisions. And uh, for consistency measurement cross-section, we can, we can try to fit the PDF and keep on increasing the precision. In fact, the RTC data itself uh, for a certain process, in particular digit process, help, help us improve the PDF uh, by quite a bit already. But let's see how they look like. Because it determines and affects the cross-section hierarchy I wrote uh, yesterday on that side of the board. Okay? So let me plot a quantity of f, uh, x times fx at the scale mu f. Okay? Let me go, just call it the mu. Mu, let me call it uh, uh, square root of 10 GeV. There's a different convention to call it Q squared, uh, but uh, okay, just, uh, just let me write it this way. So in, interestingly, uh, first of all, I think we all know from the quark models what the protons are made of, right? Uh, we all know that. What proton is uh, UUD. Right, from the quark models. Um, so what we find is the proton contains many particles. Okay? As a function of x, the maximum value of x is 1. That I take all the momentum. Of course, the chance for a single proton to take all the momentum is 0. Okay? But nevertheless, let me draw to the end. Let me draw it to the 10 to the minus 3, 10 to the minus 1, 10 to the minus 2. Okay, so I will have a high chance to find to find an up quark. Okay, I have a high chance to find a down quark. Okay, I have great chance to find gluons. Let me write it as 0.9. This is a linear scale because I decide to a 
okay? I decide to plot x times fx. x means the small energy fraction, so when I talk about 10 to minus 3, I'm already multiplying the PDF function by a very small quantity. We often do that to show things in the same plot, but even though I still have to divide proton component by a factor of 10 just to make them fit in the same plot. Okay, uh, question. Uh, and, and, uh, I don't know. The just, uh, there's a later part you can experiment yourself. I will suggest you to do that. Uh, it's reasonable to expect that. Uh, but I don't know what's the precision on that statement. Uh, okay. So, um, and then I can draw a bunch of other particles, like uh, that is having similar shape as a gluon PDF but shadowed under it. Actually, the definition varies depending on which PDF set you use, like uh, D bar, U bar, S, uh, uh, D bar, U bar. The D bar, U bar almost overlapping uh, a bit, quite a bit. Uh, U bar, D bar, S bar, and C bar. Okay. Uh, C and C bar, S and S bar, U, actually U, D, U bar, D bar, okay? So now, I see the general structure. The general structure I extract uh, from data and with certain boundary condition, which make a lot of sense, even though we are trying to do effective modeling of the parton density in the proton, there's a various boundary condition I need to satisfy. Okay, so let's try to guess what's the boundary condition of those functions. The first one is the part on A can be any, anything. Actually, it's defined, depend on your scheme and how you define part distribution function, but typically we define it uh, with up, up bar, down, down bar, strange, strange bar, charm, charm bar, and glue. In particular, in the old days, uh, even nowadays, we actually split the up quark to the up, tuck, up V and up C, up S, okay? Down into down V and the down S. What do those symbols mean? V means valence, and S means C here, okay? C quark. So I view the uh, uh, a proton uh, in this part of model is made of a bag of particles. Uh, some of them are special because I know for my quark model proton is the UUD. So the prop, there are many boundary conditions. One boundary condition you should think about is I first need to conserve energy momentum. So if I sum over all the pos possible partons in my uh, proton, the total momentum at any scale integrated over all the x choices I can have needs to be one. Energy momentum conservation, right? I have probability to find the particle i with this probability, they carry this fraction of momentum, they need to sum to be one, okay? So the other boundary condition, which makes a lot of sense if you, uh, uh, in, the, in the quark model, for instance, I also would require the integral of uh, f u uh, uh, valence part mu f uh, sorry this is number this is number not the momentum zero one dx equals two because I have two of the u quark this is a probability to find the u quark I have v which is valence that make up the counting here so that equals two. In fact, you should also define it as the following. Uh, you can also define it as 0, 1 dx of distribution function of x to find a u minus find a u bar. I'm omitting the scale choice here because this should hold for arbitrary scale. Okay. Okay. Because u bar is a c, c quark. And uh, I should have a symmetric uh, C quark component from U and U bar, okay? I will explain to you in our naive separation where does the C quark come from, okay? And similarly, I would have 
f of d valence quark. Let me just omit the scale choice here, okay? That equals one, because I'm expecting one down quark here. Okay, so those are the boundary conditions I set for my equation. I fit the data and uh, uh, get some values for this function. Question. Uh, does this mean that you must always have uh, two up quarks and a down quark, or that there is a very high likelihood that you'll have two up quarks and a down quark? Uh, um, the interpretation is a bit tricky. You know, when you say likelihood, you have to choose the measure. Okay, what are you comparing with? Are you comparing my probability to find the up quark with respect to gluons? Is it more likely to have this or that? Uh, so you have to define it properly. The first of all, you should notice I divide the gluon by 10 already, multiplied by small x. If I didn't do that, if I plot fx, this gluon blows up. Skyrocketing. So, in terms, of, in terms, of the the relative chance to find a given parton is much easier to find gluons, even at such low scale. Okay, that's a good question. But now I, I forgot to tell one picture. That is, the, how how does this bag of uh, partons look uh, come about? So let's begin with a quark. I have a quark, but I can easily emit a gluon. Okay, uh, so let's say I begin with a very balanced, uh, you know, strong high momentum quark, but it can radiate a gluon and lose some of the energy. And I can keep on radiating because this is a, a strongly interacting system, I can keep on doing that, okay? And gluon can split into other quarks, QQ bar, okay? So we actually view that uh, uh, very heuristically that I have a valence quark uh, who are, you know, uh, dominating the property, but they keep on losing energy by radiating, and the gluon keep on splitting. The split the component are the C quarks. So obviously, the gluon can also split into U and U bar, D and D bar. So that's why we have two components in the U and U bar. However, gluon splitting into quarks is symmetric. U and U bar symmetric. So that's why uh, you know, I can write C and C bar the same curve, S and S bar the same curve, and C quark the same curve. Okay, question. Uh, so since we have a C of these things, um, and we see quarks and stuff flying around, we also expect a tiny, very tiny, but still a tiny part of the electroweak stuff coming around, right? So we shouldn't expect all of these to add to a one in total, right? Like we should see a bit of nuance. Okay. Yeah, so let me repeat your question. You are saying, oh, so why, don't you only, why do you only consider the QCD interaction and talk about those strongly interacting parts? Well, in yeah. particular, just that yeah. shouldn't be exactly one, right? uh, So uh, what, I, what I mentioned in uh, try to slip away is PDF definition has schemes as well. I can try to define my scheme in this four flavor scheme. Okay. I can try to include the electric particles in the, in the PDF, photon in the PDF, it can all be done. But each choice of definition of PDF, I need to refit the data consistently because the factorization ha has to be done in a particular way. So here I'm just choosing a common baseline PDF that I only can consider a strong interaction. But indeed, you can count photon at higher energy, you can even put uh, other heavy particles, uh, bottom top, as well as electric gauge bosons into the PDF. But it's very tricky business because once you involve some ha uh, massive particles, the matching problem is very tricky, very, a lot of scheme dependence, okay? Uh, but let, let's stick to the basic picture. I have a bag of strongly interacting particles. Uh, I lose the energy by splitting and they, they give me C. So eventually, I arrive at this distribution at a given scale, okay? satisfying certain boundary conditions. And so an interesting fact and uh, uh, a fact and maybe thing you should know is, okay, I have lots of gluons, but I know my property is dominant by, dominated by those valence quark that satisfy this boundary condition. So you, you cannot help to ask yourself, uh, uh, how much momentum is carried away by those valence quark, which I think are dominant to the proton property. So you ask this question, What's the sum of the momentum taken away by the U valence and D valence, for instance? 
Okay. Uh, uh, violence quark. Uh, U. Okay. At a given scale. Uh, anyone has a guess? How much energy I take away by those uh, things I view that make up the proton? Most of it. Most of it. Uh, 10%. Anywhere, anyone guess other numbers? Uh, of course, I take uh, the, the average of these two answers. It's about 50%. Uh, <laughs> so uh, collective intelligence works, right? <laughs> so uh, you can check. It's about 50%. So it's a bit surprising. It should be surprising that uh, uh, although we view those dominant of proton property, actually the momentum are not carried away uh, out by it. Gluon and related one takes about half of the momentum. And obviously, my statement is not exact because the PDF have scale dependence. There's a mu in it, okay? So now, let me write down the uh, differential integral equation uh, that we know about uh, the pattern distribution functions. Give you a sense of uh, how we make predictions. Because you may worry that I make some measurement, derive some quantity, and uh, I use that. Is it a consistent usage? Okay. So now let me describe the lab equation. I spell all of their names in my notes, uh, but I will try to pronounce them. Uh, Dr. Uh, Teaser, uh, Gripov, uh, Lipatov, uh, Altarelli, and Parisi. Uh, the graph equation. Okay. Let me just give you a, a general form of it, this Degelab equation. Uh, uh, they, we think the PDF should satisfy this consistency condition. That is, how the PDF evolves as a function of scale equals alpha s over pi times x going to 1 times um, dz over z, p, pdf of a given particle. Uh, let me see a compact version. I have a expected, uh, I have a complex version in my, in my notes. Let me give you a compact version. So what does this equation mean? Okay. This, this one is called the splitting function. Splitting function. Splitting function. It describes in the collinear limit where I, uh, I, I treat uh, uh, this, uh, for instance, I, I start with a particle. I can radiate a gluon or another parton that have a very small transverse momentum. Okay. And, so what that, what, what's, this, uh, what's this trying to describe? This is an integral differential equation. It says the scale dependence of a part on distribution function of a part on i should uh, satisfy this, that equals alpha s over pi, which is typical splitting probability. It's proportional to alpha s over pi, times another part on distribution function of a particle j who can split into i. Through the splitting process, that initially, sorry, initially have a momentum fraction z, decide to split into two components. One, uh, one carries the x over z fraction away, so the actual momentum it carries away is x over z times the initial momentum, uh, which is so that results in x, and I sum over all the possibilities. So there's a summation of all the j's that allows this. So what this means is my, for instance, my gluon PDF, should, the scale dependence should, be, should equal this differential integral equation that, uh, that uh, any process can split into a gluon. I need to, multi I need to uh, multiply their PDF times the splitting function. Okay. It re means I reach some self-consistency of my pattern distribution function. Okay, uh, question. Uh, is J always the valence quark? Yeah. Uh, J is not valence quark, always valence. It's any PDF. So 
So in fact, uh, I, the valence quark, def the, the definition is a bit historical. I'm trying to be intuitive on this. So more than this, we just call it U quark and D quark. We use this boundary condition more. Okay. Okay. So this is self-consistency. Okay. It's actually also a perturbation. It can be defined at different order. This is a leading order splitting. Okay. It's actually a resubmission process. Just like when you're trying to solve a normal differential equation, you can solve it, but a general form, there are many terms, but there's also depending on initial condition. There's a boundary condition, right? You start with some scale, you define it, okay? So, uh, so the, the boundary condition, or in, uh, not boundary condition, initial, initial value of the function, that is something non-calculable because we don't know how to calculate a PDF. Those are just consistent conditions we list them. Uh, list here. So DGLAB equation does not solve, give us PDF directly. Instead, if I have some initial value defined, defined at a given scale, DGLAB tells me how to evolve from one scale to another scale. Okay. So this is, again, the beauty and, uh, of QFT. We know running couplings, we know how things evolve. Just things similar to that. Okay. So. Uh, it's a great idea, okay? Great uh, consistency and uh, um, uh, evolution, okay? So now, having this picture built, uh, I actually wrote uh, what the splitting function looks like for uh, various uh, splitting process in the nodes, but I wouldn't have time to go into details of them. So the next, having solved the DGLAP equation and evolved the PDF, let's take a look at how the PDF look like. This is at the 3 GeV scale, very low. What the PDF look at at the high scale? Let's say I want to produce Higgs, whose mass is 125 GeV, right? Uh, or I want to produce, I just want to mu f of the order 100 GeV, okay? okay. So let me try to plot that. Still, I'm in this log scale, I defined at this uh, uh, factorization scale. Okay. So anyone has a guess? Some of you have seen. From this low scale to the high scale, how the each curve deforms quantitatively, uh, sorry, qualitatively. Everything peak in the middle. You have a very harmonic view of the world. <laughs> yes, but recall, recall what we are trying to deal with here is the soft, the, 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 the infrared divergence part. The splitting actually have a divergence, right? And also the, there's a strongly interacting component. So, so soft and collinear divergence, okay? Which means I will make it easier and easier to populate the low X part. I'm, I'm eroding away, radiate away the energy carried, carried by those valence quarks. So what I will see, first of all, is no longer meaningful to separate the valence versus uh, the C, C quark for those U and D. So let me try to draw it uh, schematically. Okay. Uh, well, what, uh, okay. So what I will see is I still see a peak, but a much shallower peak of the U quark and still see a D quark peak. Okay. But then my my uh, 10 to minus one is a bit uh, 10 to minus two here. My gluon PDF really dominates. Okay. They take over very much earlier. Like sh shooting up. Okay, let me give it a more exaggerating version. And uh, the other C quark uh, start to uh, shoot up. But they shouldn't be more obvious than my uh, 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 up and down quarks. Okay. So, so we can draw U and D and gluon divided by 10 again. Okay. And I have a strange, strange charm. Even bottom if you want to draw it. But those strange, strange bar and charm and charm bar, they're, they're equal. Okay, it's from this uh, uh, modeling and the symmetric uh, uh, symmetry argument. 
Okay, so that's what's a PDF at about 100 GeV. You can already see factorization scale. Uh, many energy was taken away by radiation because it's very easy to radiate. Question. Uh, why does that plateau happen for the up and down? Uh, that was the reminiscent of my <laughs> old peak. I, I, I keep on getting away my, 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 my energy and momentum, but I still have some, some left over. And also recall, this boundary condition is still there. So there's the overall excess of U and D content for my, for my, for my proton. Okay. Okay. So the reason I draw, draw, draw this is just not only let, let you see the, some core concept behind uh, uh, part, you know, hadron collisions and parton distributions, it actually help us to understand what's a cross-section ranking, okay? So now, let's instead do a, a different, slightly different calculation. Um, let's calculate this. Recall my cross-section is defined as a convolution with dx1, dx2 times fx1, fx2, right? So this scans over all the different energies. So the energy I'm actually probing as hat is x1, x2, s. I can do a change of variables and do a measure change. I can change it to d s hat d y uh, divided by s. Um, should I divide by d y by s? d y by s, which I showed the measure change of this works. So I have to define y, which it will be important uh, soon. But for now, just think about it. Y is somehow I define it as a ratio of x1 over x2. So you can calculate the Jacobian and see the, uh, you know, the, this measure equals this. Okay? So what did I do? I want to check what is the parton distribution instead of as a particle 1 and particle 2. I want to check. What's the distribution as a function of the actual collision, symptomatic, the partonic collision energy? So the actual collision takes place. I need, for instance, I need to have 125 GeV to produce the Higgs, and to have uh, two top mass to start producing tops. So this is uh, as a function of partonic central mass energy. So let's draw that. Very important basic idea one should have, in particular useful for BSM physics. When you're thinking about uh, uh, what the new physics scale I can probe and what's the cross section I should expect. So here, at LHC 14 TeV, where I set my factorization scale equals, uh, okay, equals S root S hat, root S hat. Okay. Okay. So it spans over many, many orders of magnitude. So what I did in my first paper, I plotted uh, well, as a function of the uh, collision central mass energy, the different uh, uh, PDF uh, luminosity, okay? How, how big x1, uh, fx1 times fx2 that fitting a given uh, uh, central mass energy, partonic central mass energy, okay? So the leading one, I put some number here. Okay. Okay. Qualitatively, I want you to understand that the highest one, so from TV and on, is the 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 PDF from gluon and the U quark. Why? Because I have tons of gluons in my PDF. U quark, I have plenty of them. They can take a large X. Because I want to produce the central mass energy of one TeV, which is not a small number. So I want big product of X1, X2. So I have to pick what's the most probable combination. I use a big X from this. I use a big FX from this. So together, they gave me uh, uh, the largest uh, PDF in this regime. Question. What you're plotting here. Uh, I'm plotting, uh, uh, very good, I uh, should have defined better. Uh, I'm plotting um, 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 
let me see. Let me see. Let me derive the erase this boundary condition. So what I plotted earlier is f of x, x times f of x, right? So now I want to, let me omit uh, the scale choice, okay? So this is uh, dx1, dx2, 0, 1, 0, 1. So if I just plot this, this will give me a, you know, a, a function, 2, 2D distribution of, uh, of uh, 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 the probability in the two, uh, uh, two directions. I can do a change of variables to plot it as ds hat, which is the actual collision in the mass energy, times dy uh, times fx1, fx2, times the delta function that satisfies uh, uh, dy by 1 over s, that satisfies 1 minus uh, um, uh, so x1, x2 minus s hat or s. Okay, okay. So uh, there's uh, this. Uh, this is. I think I I um, I made uh, some. Um, yeah. I change the variable and try to plot it as a function where x1, x2 satisfy condition that gave me this s hat from this, uh, from this collision. Okay, I think I missed some factor, but the idea is I want to check the luminosity in this basis where I integrate over dy, the quantity of the ratio of them, so I can be directly knowing what's the, what's the part of luminosity for a given central mass energy, okay? So uh, let, let, let me keep on going. Later on, we see how I combine stuff. Okay. Um, so to, to have a high central mass energy, I need a high x plus high probability. This together gave me a highest part of luminosity. Okay. So then, obviously, the next one is uh, uh, I can have, uh, let me draw a few typical ones. Okay. So I can have a one that is dropping very fast. That is a gluon gluon. But you can imagine, because at low x, I have a lot of gluon, okay? For a fixed central mass energy as head, I, uh, if I go higher and higher, I do, would require larger and larger x. But if I go lower and lower, I need the lower and lower x, so my gluon PDF actually can go up and dominant. So at low central mass energy, Glue, glue, PDF, dominance, okay? And then I can have C quark PDFs, etc. But let me just draw the Wittens quark PDF. The Wittens quark PDF is like this. If I to do U, U initial states, uh, they initially they are low because uh, to fix this central mass energy, I don't need the two of them to be this high. I, the higher probability is one U times one gluon. So you, you actually will dominant when I require higher and higher central mass energy because with larger and larger x needed, I'm restricting myself to the right-hand side of this slice, that this part of PDF dominance, okay? Okay, maybe a small missing piece of mass is obviously because x1, x2 ranges from zero to one, okay? So uh, for any given value of s, uh, uh, s hat over s, because equals x1 times x2, the range of a lot of value for x2 is uh, between uh, 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 this ratio to one, okay? Because I cannot expect x1 to be more than one. Some simple math, but unless you do it, uh, 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 but it's needed to understand this, okay? Okay, so wh what does this tell me? Okay. What this tells me is several important facts. First of all, okay, all my partonic cross section is weighted by this uh, PDF weight, PDF uh, 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 partonic distribution functions. Okay, the weight, the weight, I just transform the weight into uh, as a function of uh, partonic central mass energy. Okay, so first of all, you see. This part of luminosity, which is 
to achieve a certain uh, a minimal scale, the luminosity drops very quickly. So PDF drops very quickly. In particular, in this in this expression, it drops as uh, 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 root s hat to the to the minus five to six power. Okay, so it drops quickly. I drop many other magnitude if I try to ask for more energy, because to carry the chance for an any given parton to carry a significant fraction uh, a fraction of the parton, proton energy is very low. If I require them to achieve more and more energy, the probability is lower and lower. For instance, when I collide two uh, protons at 7 TeV each, so 14 TeV central mass energy, the chance for me to have a 10 TeV collision, central mass energy collision, is extremely small, right? It's like 10 to the minus uh, big number, 10 to the minus 10, 11, from that part alone. Then your times the cross section is just unobservable. So PDF put a cutoff on what I can observe, okay? So secondly, Secondly, one should realize, as I mentioned yesterday, physics has thresholds, right? To produce a pair of top quark on shell, I need the central mass energy bigger than 2m top, right? This is obvious. So the convolution of parton luminosity here with the cross section, the cross section has a threshold. I have to be bigger than that. Which means I only need to I only I, I'm only allowed to to integrate over the area above 350 GeV 2m top mass, so the luminosity can be very large below this scale, but they are not useful for my t, uh, TD bar production. So the threshold, uh, uh, the ranking of the threshold also gave you a ranking of the uh, cross section because of PDF weight drops very quickly as a function of central mass energy, et cetera. So there are many things behind this. Uh, and finally, I want to say that this thing may seem, again, may seem a bit uh, abstract and formidable, uh, but uh, physics tried really hard, okay? <laughs> so we actually have uh, like Python package, C++ package, or Mathematica package. Uh, that you can just download uh, 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 the PDF and try to plot those PDF yourself and see how the PDF changes between scales. And uh, you can even know the uncertainty and how, what the data they fit, but, but every one of you, in principle, you can just download and run the sample code and get those plots yourself. Okay? It's a very intuitive way for you to understand uh, this weight. It's a, uh, Non-calculable, but evolution know uh, perturbatively and uh, beautifully extracted, and we can use that to get uh, the real collider cross section instead of uh, throwing in black box of event generator. Okay, so it's understandable, even on the uh, Mathematica, like uh, five minutes. Okay, so having set up the basics of the cross sections, I want to have a really quick recap of. Uh, Observability. Okay, so I believe uh, um, I believe uh, uh, Heiser Gray has given you an introduction to the LC experiment and the detector and the various components. So you should know this already, but I will give you a more simplistic view just to let you remember uh, or just uh, uh, just let you see and appreciate uh, what's going on. Okay, so. A theorist view things very simplistically. There's a beam pipe. I'm throwing protons together. They collide. Fancy events taking place. I put a big cylinder around it, trying to record the event. Okay. So let me define x, y, z. Okay. Beam is in the z direction. So if I just try to cut this cylinder, which is uh, symmetric around the azimuthal angle rotation. Uh, in, the, in this uh, so-called transverse z-plane is viewed like this. I have a tracking, electrocalorimetry, hydron calorimeter, muon spectrum. You should all have seen that. Okay? So let me write in symbols, muon spectrum, a muon spectrometer, hydronic calorimeter, measures energy, electromagnetic calorimetry, measures energy, and the tracking system, which is called T. Okay? 
from inner to outer. Okay. Uh, you've seen this. We use this to, to measure the particles, to reconstruct the events, and to discover Higgs. Right? So here, let me draw. I didn't get time to finish. Draw the, draw the transverse plane. Okay? Uh, so let me draw transverse plane. X, uh, okay, X, Y. In the transverse plane, I have a beam spot where particles interact. I have a system called the tracking. I have a system called e -call. I have a system called h -call. I have a system called uh, muon spectrometer. Right? So w what each particle look like? I have magnetic field in, in this uh, into the board and out of the board. Depending on your experimental setup, you, you, you have different uh, expectations. But uh, let me write down a typical particle. Hopefully, I have enough color. A photon is charge neutral, so uh, this is tracking. E call, H call, muon spectrometer. Okay, a photon travels a straight line. Doesn't see them. It, it didn't doesn't bend any electromagnetic field, so it will just go to E call and gets its energy absorbed here. So we measure energy deposition without seeing tracks behind that. We think it's a photon. Okay? Of course, we require nothing afterward. Okay? And uh, uh, if it's a neutral hydron, like uh, uh, maybe not, it's not wrong. That. If it's an electron, <coughs> uh, electron will bend under the magnetic field, leave a trace there, and get its energy absorbed. So E car absorbs all the electric energy. Let's say that. Okay. If it's a muon, it's also bend, depending on the charge direction. I will try to write an opposite one. Well, just bend the travel all the way through, leave tracks, E car, H car, leave a little bit of energy. Importantly, leave a lot of heat here. Its energy doesn't get absorbed because we cannot absorb muon energy effectively. But from multiple heats and the tracks, we can reconstruct the energy and momentum, et cetera. Okay? So electromagnetic particles. Then there's a neutral, neutral hadrons. Hadrons. Uh, let me just neutral QCD, OK, and particles. And uh, the neutral uh, 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 particles will just travel that straight line. Leave some energy here, but more importantly, all this energy is supposedly absorbed here. Okay? And for the charge, the for the charged hydronic particles, they will bend according to their charge. Uh, leave tracks in the tracking, leave a little bit of energy here, leaves all its energy here in the ideal detector. Okay, so this is not surprising to everyone, right? You've all, all seen this. Good. So now I'm going to write a table and ask a slightly different question. Okay. Uh, so in connection to exotic BSM, because I realize I'm behind the schedule, I'm mixing up things uh, uh, between lecture two and lecture three a bit. Okay. So tracking, e call. H call, muon spectrometer. Right. Photon is seen here, right? Electron seen here, seen here. Muon seen here, here. Many here. Leave some trace by so low energy, nobody noticed that. Okay? And then uh, charged hydrons, let me call it QCD, gave a track. Leave a bit of energy in the e call, but not the majority. The majority of part of it is here. I will still write the check mark here. Okay? And the neutral hydron, like a neutron and other neutral mesons, uh, no, track, no tracking, some energy in the e call, a little bit, okay? but many here. Okay? So let me ignore this. Okay? Okay? So obviously, you see every particle has different number of checks. So I can identify them. I can measure their energy momentum 
infer their energy value, make precision measurement of energy, et cetera. Okay, so now it's a small question for you. Can I switch the order of those quantities? Why I lay, lay out my machine like this? It's yes or no answer. Uh, yeah, of course the answer is no. Uh, any, any, any quick answer of why not? Yeah, uh, that's great. Okay, let's do that, uh, this exact example. If I switch order of these two, right? Their energy is going to be fully absorbed here. They are not going to penetrate the ECAR in an ideal world. So electron will leave no tracks because they doesn't penetrate to the second subsystem. So I will have no ability to, to separate the electron and the photon. I lose one layer of uh, particle identification. Similarly, I can do, do many different things. Okay. Yeah, so in, let me do a simplistic view. Uh, also from Heiser's talk, you should know they have different spatial resolution ability. Tracking has awesome spatial resolution, right? So I can reconstruct tracks. But calorimetry has finite resolution. So in fact, usually you can view it as a perfect absorber, one simple layer. I have no directional information in a simplistic view, okay? In reality, I may have certain tracking uh, ability from this very crude, uh, uh, low granularity detector, uh, but the ability is very low, so my separation ability will be very low. Okay. Okay. okay, so similarly, you can practice this yourself. If I move those components, switch the order, uh, it would be, wouldn't be as easy as nice to, to identify those particles. So the layout, is actually optimized to identify this class of particles, okay? Do we have other particles we need to worry about in standard model that we want to detect? We have so many standard model particles. Do we have others we want to add to this table of identification? Neutrinos, neutrinos very good. So uh, neutrinos is absolute <laughs> cross in all of them. So very nice. Actually, we need that component to uh, later on, okay? So neutrinos. But we have so many other particles, right? We have tau lepton, right? We have, um, why well, particles escape my mind? B meson, char meson, et cetera. There are many particles, right? You may think B and C is part of those charge of neutral hadrons. But in fact, all those particles, lifetime, is very short of the order 100 microns, okay? Heiser talk about the displaced vortex reconstruction and particle tagging, right? So in fact, what we discover, what we measure is still those com components. We try to use that information, especially tracking, to rec reconstruct the small displacement of those particles. So those are not what we see. Those are what we infer from those particles. And in particular, Higgs boson, top quark, W boson, Z boson, all of those. We don't see them, okay? What we see is their decay product, their lifetime is very short, and we see those things. So these are observables. We convert that and try to infer what, where they come from. So, so, so if sometimes people call this tagging. I can try to tagging. Right? I can try to, from those particles, try to inverse and near and tag some jets. They are probably coming from tau, b, or charm, or from those. So that's tagging. In modern, even more modern language, we may just call them, uh, I, I forgot the jargon, but use machine learning, right? To, uh, uh, supervise or unsupervise, uh, I, I, can, I can pick them up, right? So, so that's the basic thing. But now, related to my question, of switching orders. I would like to know, I, I, I'd like, like you to think about and have an idea. In the exotic BM, BSM signature, what if I have new physics particles who doesn't immediately decay to those particles, so I cannot reconstruct them? What if I have uh, BSM particles on this table? Uh, what if I have a uh, heavy muon that is long-lived? 
Okay, I can have a heavy muon. In fact, there's an anomaly right now uh, at Atlas more than three sigma called DEDX anomaly. Okay, so if I have a heavy particle, BSM particle, who have charge, obviously it will behave like a muon. It leaves the track. Its energy is not going to be fully absorbed by the E cow because they are energetic. They don't lose energy effectively through the 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 uh, the, the electromagnetism. Uh, and they just go all the way through. So BSM particles could behave like a muon, and, but they are heavy. So what makes them different? Let's say a heavy muon. Okay. The condition I needed to be exotic is I wanted to be long-lived at collider scale, so the particle is stable, doesn't decay back to those. Heavy muon example, there are so many of them. Uh, 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 um, you can have uh, smuons uh, uh, in uh, GM gauge media, Susie breaking, or others. Okay, so uh, heavy stable charged particles. In fact, we call it heavy stable charged particles, it's just some jargon commonly used. But they will behave like this, but their track will be different. Because they are heavy particle, the curvature they will make will be inconsistent with the muon. In fact, there will be a slowly moving particle uh, in my detector, leaving a track like a muon, but inconsistent. Okay? So it's a heavy muon. Observationally, it's an inconsistent muon. If I can design a search, try to pick them up. Okay? And you can ask other questions. What if I have a particle? In fact, uh, many of you heard, uh, um, probably Raman mentioned the uh, twin Higgs and glue balls. I have hidden strong dynamics, right? So I can produce a uh, uh, a new phase particle, neutral particle, they travel a certain distance and decide to decay in the E cow, H cow, MS, muon spectrum. They can decay back to standard model with displacement. Let's make it simple. What if I have a particle X decide to decay to an electron plus uh, you know, some invisible part, missing energy, uh, or dark matter, whatever, okay? That's, it collide, that doesn't register at colliders. What, what this electron will look like? This neutral particle can travel outside of the tracking system, decide to decay. It will leave some energy in the E car, right? So if it can be observed, it will actually will fake a photon. This electron can fake a photon if there's a BSM, right? And if it travels further into H car system, it will leave some energy deposition in the H car. If H car doesn't absorb this electron's energy fully, it will actually hit the muon spectrometer, okay? So each component in the world now that we have very exotic BSM signals, we have to revisit their capabilities and think about what the role they can play uh, in terms of uh, various BSM physics. In particular, if there's a space displacement uh, involved because all of our algorithms, detector designs, are optimized for prompt particles of standard model. Okay? Detectability. So having this part of calculating cross-sections, yesterday we learned a hierarchy between the cross-sections, and now we know how particle looks like at the colliders. Okay? I think we are ready to discover Higgs. Okay, so it's 10 year anniversary, let's discover Higgs. Uh, <laughs> as a theorist, uh, anyone remembers how, how we discovered Higgs? I think, in which channel? H2 gamma gamma. H2 gamma, gamma. Okay. Any other channel we remember? This one is not five sigma back 10 years ago on July 4th. Hmm? Four leptons, okay? So Higgs to four leptons. Okay. So let's discover Higgs. You understood, you understood how the how the cross-section ranks, and also the, how those particles look like. So first of all, you know the digit cross-section dominance, right? So collider is actually a busy environment of jets. They are, they are all around, okay? In particular, I, one thing I want to mention, the, the, the forward scattering dominance of cross-section, okay? So I have lots of jets here, okay? And also I have lots of jets in all of those plates compared to any other weak process. Okay? So jets is a, uh, is a busy environment. But I forgot to mention one thing. Uh, uh, 
one thing I want to mention before we discover Higgs. So Higgs property that Sally have told you already, but let me just give you key numbers. BB bar, BK branching is 58%, right? Uh, WW is uh, um, 20 something, but uh, let me be uh, precise, okay? So WW is 21.5%. Charm charm is 2.9%. There's a few quiz questions I put in there uh, for you in my notes uh, for fun about those properties. That that is 2.6%. Mu mu is 0.022%. And the gamma gamma is 0.023%. Okay. So what does this mean? This means if I produce the Higgs, most likely it will decay to VB bar. Subsequently, WW, tau tau, CC, also glue glue is 8%. And then those channels, right? I have plenty of Higgs produced at the RC. However, I couldn't make a discovery through those channels. What I discovered through is this channel, di photon, which is only like a premier of the total Higgs I make. Okay, the next channel contribute equal amount of discovery potential. Is that that going to four leptons? Branching fraction of Z, Z2 leptons. Here in collider, leptons we mean first two generation. Electron mu on that we can directly see. Okay, each of them that added together is about 7%. I require both Z decay to them. So it's BR squared. This quantity is 0.5%, right? So 2.6% times 0.5%, that's the, another leading channel of discovery. Okay? You should understand, you think, why we produce so many Higgs in those so many good channels, but why we try so hard and discover only in those very rare channels. It, the answer should be clear now, because all the other channels has huge background from QCD. Okay? So QCD, that's a hierarchy of cross sections. Okay? So, uh, of, I mentioned earlier, I have lots of jets, okay? I can have W decaying to leptons, I pay price, but I, I, I miss some energy that I cannot measure. The neutrino is unabsorbable, so I cannot reconstruct the resonance. So WW contributes in the discovery in the early days, but I'm not dominating. So it's really dominating, it's those so-called clean channels. Rare, but clean channels that have low background. I'm, I'd rather pay such a price uh, to, to sacrifice my statistics in order to pick up the Higgs and make sure I made a discovery, okay? So what I want to show you in this part is uh, not only help you recall the Higgs discovery, but I also want you to know the reason we choose those makes sense. That's because how we should think about the Hadron Collider environment is there's a clear ranking of cleanness. Where does all those lepton come from? They come from weak boson production, which is actually low on the ranking. Right? Photon is even lower. The more leptons and photons I ask for, the lower the background are. Okay? Isolated leptons, photons. So let me rank cleanness. Okay? Depending on which de detector you're working on. Someone think muons are clean, more clean than electrons. Some think electrons are more clean than muons. Uh, very complex story. Photon. Those are the clean objects. Okay? Jets. Beautiful everywhere, but <laughs> we need to try, try to do hard work. And machine learning helps. Before that, there are many, many, uh, actually we are the, uh, pioneers in, uh, in adapting big data. We use the multivariable analysis, neural networks from boosted decision tree from very early days, okay? But the ranking of cleanliness is as simple as this. The more you require, the, clean, the lower the backgrounds are, okay? So in fact, the diphoton, has many background, even though this is a discovery channel. What I find in the Higgs, in the diphoton channel, is on the continuum background, I have a small bump at 125 GE. But for the four leptons, okay, for the four leptons, this is a function of the diphoton invariant mass for leptons. What I find is I have no background. I have a little bit of fake background. Each component I can understand, a different mass, but my Higgs is here. 
clearly low background. This is event counting. Okay. I made this discovery 10 years ago. Uh, way, okay. <laughs> uh, okay, I didn't contribute much, okay. So we made the discoveries 10 years ago, uh, mainly on those channels. We search, of course, we search every channel, but Collider makes sense, okay? I hope this helps you build up basic pictures. Next time we can talk about how we look for various BSM in a more broadly defined class, and we understand this bump hunting and his discovery better in the one layer deep, deeper. Thanks. Okay. No questions. Uh, okay. Uh, is there a clean reason why?